Here is our third World War II veteran that we're interviewing tonight, Mr. Frank Colonnese of Little Falls, New York. And I'd like to ask him a few questions about his experiences, and we'll keep this informal like the rest of our uh, interviews have been. Frank, were you drafted or did I you I was drafted. You were drafted. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you lived in? I lived in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Bridgeport. Mm -hmm. When did you come to Little Falls? Came to Little Falls in 1962. So you've been here 24 years now this year. Well, I guess that, years. that qualifies you for citizenship in Little Falls, <laughs> I guess. 20 years is usually what we figure. I wouldn't, I'm not in a hurry to leave anyway. <laughs> All right. It's a nice place to live. Yes. A lot of people like it here. Well, let's see. You were drafted. Uh, what about what time was this? I was drafted in June of 1944. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I worked in uh, a milk plant in Bridgeport and in Waterbury, Connecticut, and I had a deferment for that. Mm -hmm. And um, then I had an unusual experience that kept me out for a little while longer. Um, I was called up, I think it was in the end of 42, 43, and um, had to go to New Haven, Connecticut, for induction. Mm -hmm. And um, I had something happen just uh, a little while before that. And uh, I went, I reported, and got on a train with the, and a couple hundred men, maybe three or four hundred men, from our, our uh, area, and uh, reported to New Haven. I was in this huge reception center. There was hundreds of people there. And all of a sudden, somebody started hollering, bring that guy down here. And you can imagine, it was complete silence. Everybody kept still. Yeah. And they were looking for me. <laughs> well, <laughs> I had been in an accident shortly before that, and I reported with my, my arm, my left arm, in a sling. I had ripped my collarbone apart. And uh, <laughs> I don't know what when the officer, major, or colonel got me down there, he says, what the hell are you doing here? And I reported as I was supposed to. Get him the hell out of here. And that took me out. And that kept me out for about a year and a half, I would say, almost two years, because they left me on as um, disabled. Yeah. And I wasn't anxious to go in because I had two brothers. There were three boys in our family, or two boys. My younger brother had gone in in January of 45, and my older brother was in National Guard, and he went in in 19, let's see, 1939, I think he went in. Yeah, they called in some guards. He, he went in, right, first ones called in, right? So, uh, finally I, I was drafted, reported to New Haven, and sent to um, Fort Devens, Massachusetts. And yeah. was there just a short time then sent down to Camp Blanding, Florida for infantry basic training. Yeah. And I was there. Training was 16 weeks. I was there about three or, three or four months. I enjoyed basic training because I had been farm. I lived part of my youth on a farm, outdoors, and I enjoyed it. And, uh, one of the few <laughs> TIs that could say they liked the parade. I enjoyed the parade. I really enjoyed it. And not... <laughs> Many GIs will say that. <laughs> no, but of course, in basic training, if you've got a good uh, company and mm -hmm. a good platoon that you're in, and you've got a good drummer who's keeping good cadence, and we had some bands and everything, pretty there. good, yeah. And uh, and I suppose there's a certain lift to that. Florida must have been pretty good for basic training, though. It was a lot hot. better. Than some hot, people very hot in the north. I remember people right. going to Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania, in the winter, and that was mm -hmm. that was really bad news. Our temperature was 115 when we trained. Oh, well, that's a mm -hmm. little bit hot. Yeah. yeah, full steel pack, and yeah. uh, away we go. You know, it's, it's pretty tough. But I, I enjoy basic training. <laughs> Did you get any uh, passes? Any weekend no. passes? We, yes, we would go to Jacksonville to the beaches there for passes. I only had a couple of passes. Yeah. I wasn't there long after uh, basic training. I didn't stay there very long. At that time, that was. Uh, September 44, and uh, the need for manpower was getting uh, quite urgent. Yeah. I had men with me in basic training that were in their 40s, married men with children at that oh. time. So uh, there was an urgency about getting our training yeah. over with and getting us going. Um, 
I had, uh, I got gassed in basic training. They had uh, a training session where they, uh, Lewisite gas, I believe it was, where they would, uh, it would be a liquid and it would turn into a gas and then you would run through. Yeah. Put your gas mask on. Put your gas mask on they after you us, run through. Right, they sent us through before uh, it turned from a, a liquid into a gas. I had it on my face and my upper uh, part of my body. So that set me back a little bit with the training program. So I was there a little longer than the original group. But after that, I went to, uh, must have been, oh, July, August, September, October, I guess I left there. I went to Fort Meade, Maryland because I had missed my group, and uh, I was all by myself, and just seemed like they went didn't know what train. to do. By train, yeah. yes. I went by train yeah, down to... Everybody traveled by train. Yeah. Went by train to Florida, and then back up the coast. Yeah. And uh, I was in Camp Shanks. That was supposed to be the uh, staging area for uh, going overseas. Yeah. I put on a ship in um, New York, and left for Europe. Germany I never got still. home. I, I got I got some passes. I have relatives in the New York City area, yeah. and my mother came down and I visited her there uh, just once or twice. I can't remember. The German submarines still pretty much a threat in 1945. Yes. Yeah. We had uh, all blackout on the way over, and uh, there was a convoy. We were in a convoy. North Atlantic in the winter was probably we went, rough cross. No, we went uh, we, we went uh, to Marseille. We landed oh, in Marseille, France, yeah, okay. Mediterranean, yeah. right? All right. And um, they had training programs on ship. They fired their I don't know what size they were, maybe five oh. inch guns and firing and yeah. practice. Mm -hmm. and I enjoyed the water. It was just I wish I had gotten in the navy. Once I got on that ship and uh, the waves, you know, about <laughs> fifty or I don't know how high they were. But go up and down. I, I really enjoyed it. Quite an experience to stand on a lower deck and the water's peaking above you. Way, yeah. way above. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> you I know most most everybody was down. sick. I didn't oh, get yeah. sick. There was yeah. two or three of us that did not get sick. But mm -hmm. It was terrible getting in the hold. Everybody was sick. Yeah. And um, there were just a few of us. They let us up, up on the deck and we spent nights and nights up on the deck. And, um, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the water. How long was it? About a week or more on it? Two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah, I'm not sure. You know, you can't well, remember yeah, those it's things. It's been a while. Yeah. It's been a while. So you got to Marseille, and then mm -hmm. were you assigned to uh, your regular unit then? Or? No. Um, they uh, put us on C-47s. They flew us up to Verdun from Marseille. Uh, well, World War One battlefield, Verdun. Well, that was in December. By the time yeah. I got there, it was in December. The Battle of the Bulge was very close to right. yeah. Yeah. yeah, I got assigned to uh, 35th Infantry Division. I went in in the Battle of the Bulge as a heavy machine gunner. 50 caliber? 30. 30 the caliber water, water, water cooler, water cooler right. Okay. Yeah. Incidentally, I was up to uh, Utica last summer when they had the uh, Vietnam Memorial. Yeah. And they had some uh, National Guard, I guess they were, parading there. Mm -hmm. I went over and I asked them, I said, uh, do you fellas still use uh, heavy water cooled 30 caliber gun. What's that? These young fellas you know, look at each other and say, what's this old guy talking about? <laughs> 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 it was gone. You ever try to use one without the water tank and the hoses, you have to drive corks in and after a couple hundred rounds it blows up and steam comes all over yeah. it there. There was plenty, we Never. had plenty of barrels though. But I, I thought I was lucky because my spec number was 605, a heavy machine gunner. Uh -huh. I was in company H the infantry regiment, 137th, that's heavy weapons, that's company, heavy weapons. Yeah. and uh, I wasn't a 745. Who was that was the, the right, light weapons, yeah. That, that was the rifle man. The dog, dog yeah, man on the front end. Yeah, I remember that very yeah. well, yeah. I flew up to Verdun, and uh, uh, when we got on the plane, they said, now we're not, we don't have any uh, protection, there's no armament on this plane, and uh, hmm. if we get attacked, by fighter planes, uh, the only thing we can do is slow down. Oh, so wow. we're going along <laughs> and uh, you know, sleepy as up there was warm. All of a sudden, the damn plane slows down. <laughs> we were going in for a landing. <laughs> we thought that was it. But well, then I went to replacement depots, and then it started getting tough. 
because then I was getting bombed and uh, hearing all these stories about frontline action. And uh, I had a friend of mine, a fellow I met going over from the state of Washington, Lloyd Botmiller. And he and I uh, were buddies. We chummed up together. And um, I know when we were in the, the depots, and uh, we would sleep back to back because it was cold. And it was cold in here. It, would, it got be, we would shake so much because we were so frightened. I mean, scared, really scared. And it would be quite a thing to, who was shaking the most of the two of us, you know? And, and we did that every night. I mean, we were straight and bombed there as we moved up to the front. And I went in with uh, Patton's 3rd Army, 35th Division, in the southern part of the, uh, the bulge. Up through the Bastogne, like that? I didn't go that there? far, no. It, it's a funny thing because once you get in that position, uh, all you really think about is self survival. You, oh, you yeah. know, you, yeah. you, you don't think too much about anything, about just taking care of yourself. You take orders, you do what you're supposed to do, you go where you have to go, and uh, mostly you're concerned about survival. You don't uh, really think of yourself. And your friends who will help you survive. Well, you do when you get together, but uh, a lot of times, you, you know, when you're separated, and I mean just a matter of feet or yards away, you're, you're on your own. You get into a foxhole by yourself, and it's a whole world of your own, you know. Of course, that was in heavy winter. There was a bad yes. winter that year. And you Very were in cold. Snow, yeah. And probably difficult digging uh, foxholes. Mm -hmm. I've I, seen uh, pictures of the Battle of the Bulge area, and it was, you know, snow. I, my first experience was uh, on top of a hill. I went up, it was at night, things had quieted down, and um, I was supposed to dig a foxhole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I got teamed up with a sergeant, and he said, dig a foxhole here. And, well, it's all rock, you know? <laughs> and uh, we started getting shelled. Fortunately, nothing came right in close to me. One of my friends who had gone over with me older man. He was in his 40s. He had a family. He was wounded the first night from artillery fire. That's the first night we were there. But anyway, I dug a hole in that rock. <laughs> <laughs> and Sergeant came back. He looked at me and said, how the hell would you ever dig that hole? But that was, every time a shell would go over, I'd dive in that hole. Get you a know? little extra. That's yeah, right. Just, to, just yeah. to protect myself. <laughs> It, it's terrible. I could sit here and talk to you for hours, as Mike knows about combat, and uh, uh, you, you just can't grasp the, no. the, the horrible situation, and the fright yeah. that, that you experience. Like, I was in combat a month before I could eat a meal. I would eat and vomit everything. I was just so frightened. Because we were in, in the balls, it was sometime into January, it must have been the middle of January, near the end of January. I was on the front line, and you know, you go over there and get into that. The Germans were uh, pretty good by that they, time. The ones who survived were real experienced. Uh, the they troopers, were good. So. Uh, I read somewhere that Eisenhower said that if, if the Americans alone had to go against the Germans, they wouldn't have made it. That's why you get into a lot of politics about uh, Eisenhower and World War II. Yeah. And how he wanted and felt they needed the Russians on the other oh, yeah. front. Yeah. Because yeah. There are, I've never read anything specific about uh, matching up the Americans against the Germans. But uh, I have read by Eisenhower that he had some reservations about the American army going against the Germans all by themselves because a German was a good fighter. They were very disciplined. Uh, very disciplined, very, uh, and they were smart. Under control, yep. yeah. They had good weapons. Yep. That 88 uh, cannon they yeah. had was the best, in, the best of any, any army. Yep. And uh, when they made a stand, then it was trouble. When they really stood their ground and held, held the point, then you had trouble. Yep. But we beat them. Yes. We beat yeah. them. And, uh, well, let's see, uh, in the Battle of the Bulls, and then that was that was cleaned up by probably the middle of January. Mid January. So, yeah, that was a serious uh, matter. Yeah. 
Uh, my stepfather was captured. He was with the 106th Infantry Division, which was a brand, totally brand new unit. That was one of the first units that the Germans hit. It was on the, oh, on the uh, left flank of the American armies, very close to the junction between the American and British armies, mm -hmm. which is where the Germans chose to hit, which was a smart thing for them. And they just, I guess they literally blew this 106th Division mm -hmm. right away and captured a whole bunch of people. Of course, it's the middle of winter and it's a little cold and rather than dig a hole in the ground, you're gonna find a barn, right, to get into or a house. And that's the situation probably a lot of them were in when the Germans, they weren't expected to attack. That was a, yes, was really un un a surprise, a surprise move. Yeah. No air cover because the weather had been so weather bad. Weather was bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they moved in there and they, uh, there was talk about uh, shooting, not Germans not taking any prisoners, shooting any prisoners they took. Well, there was one incident, I can't and remember the, the name of the village, but you may remember it where they did kill 150, 200 American prisoners in a field. Malmody, that was the name of the town. It was uh, probably in Belgium somewhere on the end of that line. Yeah, and they used uh, American uniforms to come over. Yeah. We felt that we had one position we were in firing overhead fire with machine gun. We felt that uh, Germans had walked by us in, in uh, GI uniforms. We were in a barn and uh, just moved around behind the barn and we weren't out from the front of that barn. The front hadn't gone by maybe five or ten minutes when they blew the front of the barn out. So mm -hmm. I knew where our gun was. Mm -hmm. Luckily, nobody got hurt. So the Battle of the Bulge was over. Did you get to pull back and refit a little bit? Get some yes, well, we went something? down to the Seventh Army, down in the southern part of France, southern part of Germany. Mm -hmm. And we, that was a holding position down there. Yeah. That was all guard duty and uh, front line duty got my head blown off there once too. And uh, a lot of patrol, a lot of patrol action in that area. That was frightening up in the mountains, the Vosges Mountains, southern part of Germany, southern part of France. Winter, cold, you know, yep. foxhole is full of snow. Yep. Right. A little frostbite. Yeah, that's frostbite my feet there. are frostbitten, that's right. I never got taken off the line for it. Everybody was in the same boat, so they weren't. Now this was in the days before insulated boots or anything. So yes, it was we leather wore boots leather and wool socks. Overshoes. That was that overshoes. overshoes. Yeah, the big old buckle overshoes. Right. Uh, in the 50s, they developed what they call a Mickey Mouse boot for the Korean campaign. Mm -hmm. And it was a great big black looking, uh, like Mickey Mouse's feet. But they were warm if you stood still. But if you had to walk up a mile, your feet would be full of. Well, that, was, that was what was so hard about the infantry because you were active all day, yeah. you were fighting or marching, and uh, you'd be warm, yeah. and uh, then at night you'd have to dig in and uh, it'd get pretty cold and start slowly freezing. That's where the Calvados came in handy. Yeah, if you could get any of that. We did. All right. <laughs> all you had to do was take one or two shots, get in your foxhole, and slowly everything just, just everything drifted just away. Who was on guard duty while <laughs> this Campbell dose was flowing? We took turns. Yeah, That's right. one thing we never never let up on. No, you wouldn't, you no. wouldn't be around mm -hmm. sometimes if you did. So then you were captured by the Germans at one well, point. Well, that was later. After we were down in the 7th Army, then we went up to uh, the 9th Army, uh, the northern part of uh, France. Things were moving there. pretty much then? It was a fluid uh, Yes, yeah, so that was a drive to the Rhine River when we went up north. Mm -hmm. We went up through Holland, uh, Luxembourg, and uh, that was forced mar a lot of forced marches in there. You know, walking, walking, uh, walking. You're almost sleeping when you're walking, yeah. moving up all the time. And that's the advantage I, I always felt. I was lucky being a heavy machine gunner. You know, occasionally you would want to the front line. Truck, yeah. Yes, or you would fire overhead fire. You know, and it'd only take uh, like two or three men on a gun, and the rest of the guys would get in the building and warm and sleep and uh, take it easy. Uh, where it got tough is when you had to go with the rifleman and then you were right on the front line. That's how I got captured. I got, I was up in Holland and uh, after we got to the Aurora River, we pulled back and uh, uh, we had, some came, somebody came through and said, there, anybody want to pass to go see a, a show? And this must have been, I can't remember time, it must have been February. February, and I said, yes, I'd take it, you know, and here I am, dirty, I only changed my clothes 
two or three times in the well, three months I was on the front line. I only changed my clothes a couple of times. Yeah. I think I had one shower all that time. So I am dirty with my rifle and get on the truck and I go and Lily Ponds Lily Ponds. Was in, yes. in, in Holland. She was the Apperson. Yes. And um, here I am a filthy, dirty person, you know, like everybody else in the audience and most of and she comes out with an evening gown on, singing opera music, you know. I was so overwhelmed by this, you know. Yes. Tears streaming down my face that here, after being in this horrible situation for so long, you know, yes, yes. not thinking there's any, any relief from right. it, and here I see this beautiful woman come out singing opera. She might come kind of in a, another world entirely. And that was just for one night, and I'm back on. Did you ever read any of Kurt Vonnegut's novels, uh, Slaughterhouse Five? Mm -hmm. He was captured during World War II by the Germans. He was in the paratroops, and uh, some of the stuff that he puts out is, you know, surrealistic. It's basically what it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. You go from one situation zip to just another. Just incredible. Just like that, you know? I think if Mike would know, if you're in front line, uh, you know, just the fact that you're in the front of a building and the back of the building is like day and night. Huh? It's like being, being yeah. nowhere near it, you know, just the distance of a building. I know when I first got overseas, or I first got on the line, um, um, I was so, a couple of different attitudes people have, I was so terrified that uh, if I got in a building, I wouldn't sleep anywhere in a building. I would get in the cellar way back, away from the line. And that's the way I had my protection, you know, that was my security. I was so terrified. <laughs> you can't imagine how, Mike, you can maybe verify how terrified you can be. It's almost, it, it is unexplainable. Right? Yeah. Huh? Well, people are trying to kill you, and that's really, uh, yeah, it's just that's the terrible. ultimate thing. And once you get on the line, right on the front line one time, and it's a whole new ball game. You know? We went there, we went to the Rhine River. I know when we came to the Rhine River, <laughs> They had a, a footbridge over a canal somewhere near the river, and they wanted our 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 patrol to go across that footbridge. And we had a fellow named Baker <laughs> from from Kentucky, and he was telling the boss and our sergeant, he said, "I'm not going across that bridge." He said, "We'll never make it, you know. I don't care what you do to me." He said, "I'm not going across." Fortunately, the Germans blew up the bridge, and we didn't have to go across it. Terrifying to think that we would have to go across that river, canal in the river. Were you near the bridge at Ramaga? No, that Virginia was in the so there. further south. I, mean, I was up in the northern part. I was up near Wessel, in the northern part of Germany. A friend of mine, and Tony would know him, uh, Glenn Salzburg, used to be a guidance counselor yeah. here, was one of the first people to cross that bridge at Ramaga. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was telling me about this. This was. Well, he went from guidance counselor here to Mohawk Valley Community College. He was in the guidance department there for years. He may be retired now, I don't know. But uh, he was right across that bridge. That was a very famous Sometimes thing. your first first people across don't have too much trouble. It's after no, they get over there, right. then they're in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're going to tell us about your capture? After, yes. After we went across the Rhine River, um, there was an autobahn in that area. That we had to go on with the Audubon. And that day I was with the rifleman right on the front line with him. And uh, the rifleman had gotten into the town um, just a little bit before we did. When we came up towards the town, we were all together. And when I say together, we're not all in a group, you know, there's two or three fellows yeah. out in the lead and the rest of them bringing up the rear. And um, they went up through the town, they didn't find anybody in the they didn't have any support, so they came back. And uh, we went a little way into the town, then pulled back, and we got into this building, and uh, we had a lieutenant with us. Our lieutenant was with us. First time I ever had a lieutenant on the line with me, an officer. And uh, we had our radio with us, so we had radio contact with uh, company headquarters. And we were at, right at a junction in the road, and we got into this big building. Germans attacked, trying to push us out, and uh, they couldn't do it. We were in that building from 8 o'clock in the morning until 2.30 in the afternoon. And 
we could have gotten out several times, but every time they'd call back to the headquarters, they'd say, no, hold, crossroad, we want to bring tanks up, yeah. and we'll put them on the Autobahn. Well, finally, the Germans brought their tanks down, set them in front of the house we were in, blew the house apart. and start blowing the house apart. Right? I showed you the article in the, in yes, the magazine yeah. there, yes. 23 men in the building, and uh, when they, they blew the, the walls down in the building, blew them down the upper floors, I was in the cellar at the time guarding some civilians, and uh, they blew a hole right through the cellar wall, knocked me back against the wall, and they sprayed machine gun fire. And uh, when it ended up, <laughs> the 23 guys were all stuffed in the stairway <laughs> between the first floor and the cellar, all piled up on top of each other. And uh, it took a while for them to uh, stop firing. I, I didn't think they were going to stop firing. The rest of the fellows felt the same way. But finally, they did, and uh, just took us out of the building, took us back. And, uh, when they took us back, they lined us up in front of a stone wall, uh -oh. and they brought a half track up, uh -oh. and, uh, yeah. crouched on the gun. Yeah. And uh, Baker was next to me, and he said, what are you going to do? He said, this is it. He said, we're not going to get out of this one. Couldn't do anything. Like they're trapped. But fortunately, they didn't do anything to us. And then they marched us back uh, in behind their lines. And uh, that was a, you know, all day long affair. I've got a letter for there. If you want to read a letter later from uh, it was, yes. from uh, a fellow that was in the woods right across from where the house was, and had been had a front seat to the whole thing all day long. They could have got us out. He says in a letter that they could have got us out, but uh, they thought we were holding our own pretty good and uh, leave us there and hold the crossroad. And right after that, the tanks came down. So it was too late then. Yeah. So the prison camp, uh, how far back was that? Well, I, I, didn't, I got into a school where they had some prisoners for just one day. Uh, mainly, they were bringing us back and uh, marching us east. We walked, we rode on trucks, and um, there was, right at that time was the Aurora Valley Encirclement. Oh, yeah. And in fact, I saw the closing of the Aurora Valley uh, Encirclement, and um, we had gone back as far as we could east. Mm -hmm. And we were up on top of a big hill looking down into a big valley, I don't know, 10, 20 miles you could see. It was late in the afternoon, almost evening, and we could look down and we could see the firing from both directions, and it was yeah. the, the closing that part of the gap. And they turned us right around and marched us back uh, west from where we were. I ended up in a, in a prison camp, and I, I don't know the name of it. I keep trying to find out where it was, and I can't find out. And um, there was German or uh, Italian prisoners, Polish prisoners, and French prisoners in that camp, and uh, they were working in a coal mine. The only part of it I can remember. I was only in that for uh, oh, maybe two or three days. And we were liberated. When I, the 23 men, finally, um, we got into a column. There must have been 500 or 1,000 men, American prisoners. Mm -hmm. They just kept bringing them all together. And we were strafed by American planes. finally put us in this camp, and when the Americans liberated us, they said they knew finally who we were walking uh, in this column, and uh, they knew who we were, and they watched for us, and they got us out as soon as they could. I was a prisoner for 16 days, and I lost 20 pounds. And we, uh, the Germans didn't have very much food. They gave us a little cup of uh, soup, watery soup, a piece of, piece of black bread, and a little sugar. And once in a while, we got that. We had uh, had a, a wagon, uh, normally pulled by a horse, and we had to take turns pulling the wagon that had the German prisoners' personal belongings on it and what food they had was on the wagon. And we had to uh, pull the wagon as we traveled around. But near the end there, I was, well, once we got in camp, I, I found uh, a storeroom steal some bread once in a while, right 
that was the last, second to last day, I think, of the prison. But while we were marching around, I was eating grass off the road. I was so hungry. Just didn't have anything to eat. Couldn't feed us. And they were pretty rough with us. Pushed us around quite a bit until the encirclement. And then their whole attitude changed. Oh, wow. Well, uh, yep. I can understand that. Yeah. Everything changed after that. It's a good thing they didn't win the war. Well, I, I, met, uh, I met a German officer, oh, I must have been about a week before, while I was a prisoner, a week before I was liberated, and he was very, very strong, very adamant. He said, we are going to beat you yet. He said, we have something coming. He said, we're going yeah, to beat you yet. They believed that, yes. Yeah. And he was very Secret weapon, always. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. He thought, sure, they would still win the war. Well, of course, they were working on a form of atomic weapon, yeah. but it didn't pan out for them. So, did you get special treatment uh, by the Army after being released from prison? Because you I were thought you were in the Army. And, yeah, I was, yeah. <laughs> well, I probably shouldn't have asked that question then, should I? No. No, no the Army doesn't give uh, the infantry any special no. treatment. Right? I was just so glad to, 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 when I was liberated, you know, that uh, we, they took us on trucks out of the camp and brought us to a, a building. I remember going in the door, uh, a GI officer standing there, asking me how I felt. I said, great. Well, you know, everything is fine. Well, great. He said, okay, you go that way. <laughs> uh oh, back to active duty. <laughs> and I didn't find out. I lost one of my, uh, one of the fellows in our squad. Um, I lost track of him at that time. And I didn't see him until uh, May of this year. First time I saw him. Over since that 40 day. years. Yeah. yeah, 41 years. And when he got to that point, he told him he was sick, he didn't feel good, and he went out the other door and went to a hospital. Huh. And, uh, you know, when the officer asked me, How do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> it would take on the world, you know. That was the wrong answer, I guess, Ben. Yeah. yeah. And I was so sick, I couldn't even eat GI bread. Now, you know, there's not much GI bread. No. I couldn't even eat that. It tasted like sugar so sweet from not eating just in that short period of time. Ben, let's see, this was uh, This was in May March, of, March of March. 45. I got captured in April. I was liberated. The war ended in early May. May. So they yeah. put us on planes and flew us back into France. Camp Lucky Strike. And uh, I was there about, uh, imagine a week. I don't remember exactly. And, uh, and I put on a ship sent back to the United States. I know when I was in the camp, you could have gone to Paris, you had passes to go anywhere you want. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't leave that tent. The only time I would leave that tent is when I went to eat. I wouldn't leave that area. No chance of me getting sent back up. I'm lying. Right. Okay. Or missing. They told us we were going back. And I would stay yes. there. Right. No chance of me missing that <laughs> boat. No way was I ever going to get back into that thing again. So you came home, and then... Uh, I'll give you another instance over there. I got cut in my hand with a, with a bayonet, and it was so bad I had to go back to the uh, aid station. And then when I got back there, the first thing the doctor said to me, I had it all bandaged up. I, they wouldn't let you go back alone. You had to go back with someone when you went to an aid station. They wouldn't let you go alone. You never know if you'd come back. Wow. Well, so when I got there, the first thing the doctor said to me is, what, what are you trying to get out of? He didn't look at my hand to see what was wrong with me. He looked me right now and he said, what are you trying to get out of? I thought it was a self-inflicted wound or yeah, something. Trying to get out of the yeah. front line duty. You know? yeah. Like a lot of people got shot in the foot by accident. Mm -hmm. I saw one person yeah. do that. Yeah. I, got, I went back, I got on a boat in uh, La Havre and went back to Newport News, Virginia. And a nice welcoming committee there. Nice reception we had, a lot of people oh, there. And that was in probably uh, oh, June I mean, or so? No, that was the end of April. April, yeah. I'm still, it's amazing from being a prisoner how quickly I came back to uh, the United States. Mm -hmm. Didn't take any time at all, you know, just a matter of a few weeks. Well, that's what I meant by special achievement, that they did move you right back. Mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. yeah. But we're not supposed, we weren't supposed to go back on the line again. They said once you're a prisoner, this is what they told us, once you're a prisoner, you can't come back into the same uh, area of combat. 
Geneva Treaty, Geneva, something about the Geneva? She said Geneva Convention. Convention? I really don't know. Yeah. But That's I, what they I don't think me. anybody would argue with them, would they? No, no. So, <laughs> <laughs> that would be one rule you'd want to keep for sure. Mm -hmm. for sure. And then you got discharged? Uh, no, I went, uh, I gave us a 60-day furlough mm -hmm. when we got back. I went from Newport News to Fort Devens, Mass., where I was yeah. first uh, drafted, and they gave us a 60-day furlough and uh, to recuperate. Mm -hmm. Then I went back uh, to Fort Devens, and I was there until November. I got discharged in November of uh, 1945. I was in a supply room. We were guarding German prisoners. It was ironic that uh, they, they had German prison camps in two places in New York State that I know of. Uh, camp Drum, which is now Fort Drum, there was a, a prisoner war camp there. Then out by Rochester, a uh, friend of ours, Gordy Rousseau, near his hometown of Marion, New York, they had a fairly large uh, German POW camp there. So they had them. They, they had brought them all the way over here from yes. here. They had them in uh, Massachusetts, where I was. That's, that's what we were doing, guarding uh, German prisoners of war. And it just kind of routine for me then, until I was discharged. Uh, when I first got back to uh, Fort Devens after my furlough, we had information we were supposed to go to uh, uh, the Far East. Yeah, yeah. And send us over there. Made us understand that we had to get ready to go to Japan for the invasion of Japan. Well, if that had gone on as scheduled, you probably would have ended up there. The atom bomb was the greatest thing that ever happened in yeah, 1945. A lot of people, uh, <laughs> Mike and Tony, expressed the same thing. Uh, one of them did anyway. It was great. Yeah. You know, to have that hanging over your head all that time, you know, you might have to go back into something like that. And then and it's all over. of a sudden it's over. Well, it took that to make it be over because, mm -hmm. you know, documents indicated the uh, Japanese, while the uh, Air Force had severely crippled their industry and transport, they were not in any mood to surrender many of them. It took that shock to, uh, to persuade mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Terrible thing to happen to the people in those two cities. But well, it was either that or the American soldier. And many Japanese. Mm -hmm. Probably more Japanese mm -hmm. would have died from that than by far that yes. died. In When I came home, I went to a uh, uh, <laughs> a college weekend out at uh, Cuca College. Yes. And that was on my 60-day furlough. Now I had been out of a prison camp maybe a month. Mm -hmm. And here I go. To a college? Here oh, I go to oh, a college yeah. weekend, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was just just too much for me. So then you were discharged and you went back to Connecticut. Yes, I went to Connecticut. And but I, we were talking job. about celebrations. Yeah, right. I was in was. Worcester, yeah. Mass, on, on a pass mm -hmm. when uh, VJ Day. Yeah. And the people just oh, yes. went yeah. wild, you know. Anybody had a uniform on, you know, boy, right. picking up cars, parading us through right. the street. Yeah. You know, just treated us great. The pictures of New York City and San Francisco and places like that when that all took place. But I guess the people who had to stay out a few more months didn't get any celebration at all. No, they were out of the no. country. <laughs> people forgot it by the yeah. lest we forget. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons why we do this taping, so that people may not forget. But the celebration the was great, and the people were, you know, just treated us very well, you know, like royalty, as yeah. they say. Oh, yeah. King for a day. Yes. For one day, anyway. Maybe two at the most. Yeah. One day, because you went back to camp that night and it was all over. No, it was all over, yeah. <laughs> back to KP, probably, or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Well, when I got discharged, I went back uh, back working in the milk plant. Uh, my father had been working for uh, Queensboro Farm Products Company. Well, that was prominent in this area, too. Yes, they had yeah. a plant in Canastota, New York. Right. And uh, their main office was in uh, Long Island City, New York. York City, Brooklyn, Queens, rather. And I worked there for a short time. I had a job right away as soon as I came back. Yeah. And uh, I didn't draw any 52, 50, 52, 20. 20. Yeah. I yeah. Didn't, because I went to work right away. 
Did GI Bill, did you ever take any of that? Yes, and I went to college in 1948. And, uh, Whereabouts? At Syracuse. I started at Syracuse, Syracuse. and then transferred to Utica College. Oh, okay. yeah. And um, I was working in the milk plant until, until I went back to school. Went under the GI Bill. You know, took very good care of us. Give us a test, you know, see what we're suited for, what we're qualified for, and that's how we decide what we should take. I remember many of these colleges had uh, married student housing they made out of like Quonset huts. And I remember seeing those at Syracuse years ago. They still had them. Yes. Remember the yeah. rounded hut like thing? They and had they them in Syracuse. Cut them in half, and one family moved in one half and one or another. Yeah. Did you, were you married? I wasn't married oh. then. Oh. You know? Didn't get married until after completed college. Yes, they had some outside Johnstown, too, just as you <laughs> come into Johnstown. Mm -hmm. And then they took them apart and made them into separate. They weren't the Quantison type, I don't think. They no. were more standard, but yeah. they were whole long rows like barracks what cut up. They took them all apart and sold them as houses. No, they I turned them. What did they use them for in the first place? I think they used them for, for veterans housing. Uh, veterans housing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cheap yeah. veterans housing, because yeah. veterans came back, got married, and of course, by getting married, that produced this great baby boom that went through uh, <laughs> high school and college, as some people are, are aware of, well, part of that. They had some and on uh, campus at Syracuse University. I know yeah, they, yes, 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 they had them at Utica yeah. College. Yes, they had them at Utica College, Quonset House. Yeah, they were still there in Syracuse, probably into the 1960s, but used as, as other things. Yeah, I can remember them myself. Yeah. Well, do you ever keep up with any of the people you're in Well, after that, right? you know, when I came home, I, I, I just wanted to put it all out of my mind. Uh, I tried joining the American Legion, and that didn't work out. So uh, I was so shook up. Like my family, when I was home uh, after I came on my 60-day furlough, my family wouldn't even come in my bedroom to wake me up because I'd have such nightmares. You know, and I almost tried to strangle my sister one time, but she woke me up, and come right up to the bed. You know, yeah. I was, you know, having nightmares. difficult to adjust, and uh, I never talked about it. I, I have, you know, my son Kyle, he's 32 right, years yes. old, and he didn't yeah. know I was a prisoner until just a few years ago. I just never talked about it. I just put it all on my mind. I think one thing is, you know, uh, it was hard to express yourself, you know. And, uh, I think sometimes you thought if you tried to express what you were experiencing, you know, you might be little, little, little. And it was such a profound thing that you experienced, you know, that maybe you couldn't really express what you should express to yeah. convey what it's like. And I think maybe that's part of the reason a lot of us just, just didn't say anything, just quiet about it. But a few years ago, when our, our comrades from the Vietnam War were getting such a, a terrible, terrible reception here in this country, and yeah. it, it made my again, I cliched my blood boil. And after that, I joined the Disabled American Veterans, which I am, I'm a pension veteran. Mm -hmm. I joined the XPOW organization, and um, uh, I joined my 35th Infantry Division Association, which I had never belonged to before. And it was all because yes. of Vietnam, because um, I have a nephew that uh, was over in Vietnam, and John Fraser's son, you know, so I, I have people I know, and to, to think of them being treated the way they were when they came home yeah. just got me all started on this. And as I say, I joined these organizations. And whenever there's a parade for the Vietnam veterans, I go parade. And, uh, glad to do it and uh, participate in these things now. Good. I want them to realize all right. what it's like, particularly those folks that went through that and came back. and. Uh, didn't get the reception they should have gotten. Right. We're talking by getting the political oh. thing mixed up with the the, the man that's doing his duty. Yeah. The woman right. that's doing her duty. Yes. And they shouldn't hold it against the the soldier. No. Which Especially the ones who were drafted, but even the ones who volunteered did so with good motives. That's right. Yeah. yeah. 
and that's why I, I, I've gotten involved in these things <laughs> and uh, bringing it all back again. Well, we're real glad that you could come and share this with us and for the future history. This well, area. it's something we hope they never forget because, yeah, yeah. you know, war is terrible. You commit things, you do things that uh, you, can't, you can't fathom, you can't imagine doing the things you do during war time. Survival is important to all of us. Oh, yeah. And uh, if you're doing your duty as an American citizen, that's what motivation is. Protect your country, protect your freedom. And um, I think people lose sight of that as they go along, particularly where there's yeah. nothing to, to bring it out. Yeah. Maybe, in, you know, like they say, maybe you need a war once in a while to shake people up. I don't agree with that. No, no, I, I don't either, no. But the, but the World War II was a tremendous, I have mentioned in this program before, a tremendous cataclysmic event. Mm -hmm. And if we had ever lost, uh, you know, the lives that we live today would have been totally different. So we still owe a tremendous debt to the people like you and the others that I've interviewed who saw to it that we didn't lose, who yes. laid it on the line for them. I mean, that may sound like a cliche too, but it's true. True. A lot of cliches are true, whether they're cliches or not. Yes. Doesn't matter. An awful thing to think of under Hitler, Hitler's yeah. control. His type mm -hmm. of government, yes.